I am Jessica Salagi with All on Georgia, and I'm sitting down with Senator David Schaefer, who is running on the Republican ticket for Lieutenant Governor. So thank you for sitting down with us today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, first, I'd like to start off with you telling everyone a little bit about who you are, um, how long you've been a senator, where you're from, kind of give us some background on who you are. I was, I was born 53 years ago in a home for unwed mothers run by the Sisters of Charity and adopted by uh, Jim and Sarah Schaefer when I was an infant. I was raised in uh, DeKalb County, uh, Georgia, uh, graduated from the University of Georgia, and uh, my early adult career was uh, working for the Republican Party. I was the executive director of the state Republican Party in the early 1990s. I then went into business for myself. I was elected to the state senate in 2002, and I've served in the senate sen uh, for the last 16 years. And you were a high-ranking official in the Senate, and you, you, you did not resign your seat to run for office, but what made you want to transition to the lieutenant governor, which not everybody knows that that's the office that presides over the Senate, but what was the reasoning behind your, your move? I've done everything that you can do as a state senator. I've chaired an unimportant committee. I've chaired an important committee. I've been a caucus leader. I was a floor leader for uh, Governor Purdue, and uh, was most recently uh, President uh, pro tem of the Senate, that's the person who stands in when the Lieutenant Governor is not available. I resigned from that uh, position when I uh, made the decision to run for Lieutenant Governor so I could focus on that campaign. You know, I, I, I was elected to the Senate in a special election that was um, held in the middle of the 2002 legislative session, and I was sworn in actually on day 20, which is the halfway point of the 40-day legislative session, and I'll, and I'll never forget that on the day I was sworn in, we voted on three bills, and the next day we voted on one bill, and the next day two, and it continued like that, one, two, three, four bills until day 39 of the legislative session when we voted on 80 bills and stayed there till one in the morning. And Roy Barnes was the governor, the Democrats controlled everything, and I said to myself, they're doing this to us on purpose so that we will not understand what we're voting on and so that people outside and, and so that people outside this building won't understand what's really happening. And I said, when Republicans take over, we'll do it differently. And the reality is that we haven't done it uh, much differently. We really haven't done it differently at all. In some ways, it's, uh, it's uh, worse. And, you know, I think we ought to uh, pace our work. We ought to see that every issue, I believe that every issue ought to be considered separately on its merits. We need to stop this practice of tying together unrelated bills in last minute trades at the close of the session. That almost always results in multiple bad ideas becoming law. And, uh, and, and I don't think that those things will change until the people in the top positions want them to change. And uh, I, you know, I don't, so I, I concluded that, that those are the types of reforms that I couldn't make as a member of the Senate, but that perhaps I could make if I have an opportunity to serve as president of the Senate. So as Lieutenant Governor, you would implement rule changes in the Senate, or I mean, how would you go about doing that? I don't know that rule changes are necessary as much as management changes are necessary. You know, we meet for 40 days and we do 90% of our work in a three-day period of time. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to get down to business earlier and uh, we need to pace ourselves and try to avoid the log jams that occur around crossover day and around the end of the legislative session because that's where most of the bad stuff happens. What would you say were some of your top accomplishments during your tenure as a senator? You know, when I was elected to the state senate in 2002, the budget of the state, a document about this thick when they printed it out and put it on our desks and asked us to vote on it an hour later, only described about three or four percent of the state spending, the new programs. And once a new program was approved by the General Assembly and signed into law by the governor, it automatically rolled over into each succeeding budget of the state under a single line item called continuation. So we were, we were voting on multi-billion dollar spending plans where 97% of the spending was hidden behind, you know, a one word explanation, continuation. And so the very first term I served in the state Senate and every two years for the next decade until Governor Deal finally signed it into law, I introduced legislation to do away with continuation budgeting and move us to zero-based budgeting so that a portion of the budget is rebuilt from scratch every year. And we look at all of the proposed spending in the upcoming year, even stuff that's been approved, had been approved years or decades earlier. And I think that's a very powerful tool for lawmakers to be better stewards of your tax dollars. 
Now, in the end, it's, a t it's just a tool, and tools can be used for good, they can be used for bad, or they cannot be used at all. The, we've got to continue to elect people to the General Assembly who are physically conservative, who recognize that the dollars we get to spend first have to be earned by somebody else before they're taken away, and, and we get an opportunity to think up ways to, to spend them. That's a pretty big issue to have spearheaded. It, it, I mean, I think that's the most, you know, if, if, if I'm unsuccessful in my lieutenant governor's campaign, the zero-based budgeting thing will be the thing that, uh, that I'm most proud of. I also passed a constitutional amendment that capped the state income tax. It was approved by the voters in the 2014 general election. You know, I would like to see the income tax uh, lowered. I supported legislation that uh, reduced the tax rate in this session of the General Assembly, and I worked to lower it even more as lieutenant governor. But we're the only state in the union that has a constitutional promise that the income tax rate will not go up above the 2014 uh, level. And that's good for taxpayers, and it's good for businesses that are looking to come here or expand here. The, we're the only state in the union that has enshrined in its constitution a guarantee that will forever be a low tax environment. So you are a very policy driven legislator. You're, you don't seem to have a whole lot of things in your platform or even in your Senate history that are um, ideas. It's, it's very policy and, and fact and number driven. Is that because of what you've seen is able to pass in the Senate or is that part of your values? Like where do, how do you define your ideology and where do all these issues that you have kind of spearheaded come from? Well, I'm a physical and social conservative and I'm attracted to public service, frankly, by intellectual curiosity and, uh, and by the ideas and by translating those ideas into, into good public policy. And, uh, and th you know, that's what I've done for the last uh, 16 years. And it's one of the reasons that so many uh, members of the General Assembly that have, uh, that have worked with me have endorsed me. More than 200 current and former members of the Georgia General Assembly have endorsed my candidacy for Lieutenant Governor because they know me, they know my character, my integrity, my work ethic, and, and the issues that I've concentrated on. And I know there's enormous frustration with the way the General Assembly operates in Atlanta, but most rank and file members of the General Assembly share that frustration. None of them like having 100 page bills thrown in their face and, 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 and being given you know less than an hour to understand them and then make a, a vote on them. And I, I think that the types of reforms that I'm talking about would be welcomed by them. They just need someone in, in leadership who are willing to champion those type of reforms. Well, I want to talk a little bit about some actual policy platforms and where you stand on some of the issues. Um, corporate taxes and corporate tax breaks um, have, and sales tax exemptions have all been, not necessarily in your race, but been public issues over the last several months. What is your position on corporate income taxes um, and the loopholes that are in our tax code? And do you feel like the state could do a better job of kind of monitoring or auditing what we're giving to these companies to draw them to Georgia? In the time that I've served in the Senate, I have voted for some targeted tax breaks, but I, I, I believe that the best way to make Georgia attractive to new business is to, is, uh, to make it uh, attractive to all business, and that's by having a, a pro-business regulatory environment, by having a, a low tax environment. I'd like to see our tax reform efforts going forward concentrated on lowering the marginal rate for everyone instead of picking winners and losers through targeted, uh, targeted tax breaks. Um kind of piggybacking on spending, do you feel like there are ways we can cut? Because our budget has grown considerably over the last 10 years. So where do you stand on you know, agencies that could shrink or looking down the road, what can we do to kind of rein in spending? You know, it's, it's interesting. In, in 1992, when Georgia had about 5.9 million people, the budget of state government was $5.9 billion. So we spent $1,000 for every man, woman, and child to provide the people of the state with the benefit of state government. You fast forward at 15 years, the population of the state is hovering at around 9 million people, and we passed a $21 billion budget. That's over $2,000, almost $2,500 for every man, woman, and child to provide them with the benefit of state government. Now, there was some inflation during that period of time, but it wasn't 150% inflation. And, there, and there's nobody that can look you in the eye and tell you with a straight face that during this period of explosive government spending that government somehow got two times better. Now what happened in 2008, of course, is that the economy collapsed 
and our revenues declined. We went, in fact, we, we never fully spent the $21 billion in that 2007 budget because the, the revenue numbers fell. And, and within a four year period of time, I might have my times off a little bit, the, the revenue had fallen to $16 billion. So we were forced to make $5 billion roughly in cuts. And those were difficult and painful decisions, but I frankly believe that we were, that Georgia was better for having gone through that because it focused us on what are the core functions of government and how do we deliver those, uh, the services in those areas most efficiently. Now, if we had had zero-based budgeting, a lot of those cuts could have been done more skillfully. We had to make some clumsy cuts because it wasn't really apparent to us what was in that continuation um, uh, line. Now, since that, since that $16 billion level, you, the economy's rebounded and revenue has continued to rise. What I have found in my public service is that it doesn't matter how much money comes in, politicians will spend it all. And so I think we want to put pressure on revenue because that forces politicians to make uh, smarter decisions about how those dollars are spent. That's one of the reasons that I pushed the cap on the income tax. That's one of the reasons that I supported the legislation to, to lower the income tax rate. Um, because, you know, because while I like many politicians on a personal level, as a group they really can't be uh, trusted. I have to agree with you. <laughs> um, kind of talking about spending and, and funding too, education, you know, that's always a hot button topic and I think this year was the first year in a very long time that it was fully funded across the state thanks to the governor's budget. But do you as Lieutenant Governor in your in your platform foresee a change in education funding coming? Or do you think that the way we're operating is kind of just clunking around okay? So we, we're operating under the QBE formula that was developed in the early years of the Harris administration in the 1980s. So that is now a formula that's, I'm not the greatest at math, 30 or 40 years old. And this is, you know, actually a, the first time that we have fully funded yeah. that formula. I think, um, I think we need to, it's time for us to take a look at the formula itself. You know, the 80s based formula basically uh, promised a certain number of positions would be funded um, of various types uh, based on the number of students that each school system had and, we, and we've consistently failed to keep that promise until this year. I think we ought to look instead at a, at a, fu a funding formula that is student based where instead of promising positions per student we divide up the money per student and we recognize that you know that that students with special needs require more money that um, that uh, different areas of the state have different needs and it ought to be a student-based formula instead of a uh, staff-based uh, formula what about casinos and tying that to hope and education funding where do you stand on all of that as a conversation point I'm not for any expansion of, of gambling in in Georgia and the the um, you know, the, the various casino proposals uh, that have been made would actually not put money into hope. It would create a, they would have created a separate needs-based uh, scholarship program that I think would have weakened uh, the HOPE scholarship program. I'm a big believer that HOPE ought to remain a merit-based program and not be turned into just another, you know, one of the many uh, welfare programs that, uh, that we already offer people who are struggling financially. You are from the metro Atlanta area, um, but having served for a long time, you obviously are familiar with issues of the two Georgias, and South, rural Georgia, north and south, and then metro Atlanta. What types of initiatives do you, would you like to see the Senate under your leadership kind of continue down the pathway or spearhead um, to kind of bring rural Georgia up to the same pace as much as it can be to some of the bigger areas? Well, I live in North Atlanta. My wife is from Middle Georgia, and she and I own a business actually in in Middle Georgia. So I've got an appreciation that uh, the needs of the different parts of uh, of Georgia are are distinct, and that um, you know one size fits all solutions don't don't always work. I think that um, there's two things that we have to do in order to ensure the continued viability of rural Georgia. One is we've got to shore up our healthcare system. Businesses are not going to locate or expand in an area where there is not uh, an adequate system of both routine and emergency healthcare. 
And so we have, uh, we, we have got to do what it takes to make sure that every part of Georgia is served by uh, our health care system. The other thing is that young people are not going to stay in any part of Georgia that is not connected to the internet through uh, a broadband connection. And we made a determination as a society 120 years ago that every home and business should be connected uh, to each other through a universal telephone system. And I think we've got to make that same determination about the, uh, uh, about the, the internet as well. Do you have any ideas on how to make that happen? Because the legislature had a lot of bills this year for that, but none of them really just pushed the, the, the project down the road. Any, anything considered? There were, you know, most of, the, most of the solutions that were proposed really would not have extended um, broadband coverage to any place that wasn't already served. It was really about um, giving one group of businesses a leg up over another in serving the areas of the state that are profitable to serve and very little um, to make serving the unprofitable areas profitable um, and 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 so I you know I think that uh, you know I think that we can look at using the existing telephone uh, universal service fund uh, for broadband as well um, but it's going to be I mean there's going to be some tough decisions that have to be made if we determine this is a worthy societal goal that everyone ought to be connected to each other, uh, you know, on the internet, just like we made that uh, a, a goal with the telephone system. Well, and there's been some arguments that it is the new infrastructure, it is the new highway system. You know, it used to be that counties needed um, interstate access to be marketable, but like you said, we have counties down here where people are getting internet from satellites, and it's just not reliable. So right. I guess. Do you feel that there is a, a role for the government to kind of assist or whether that assisting is getting them out of the way, out of regulations out of the way, or what does that look like for you? No, I, I believe that in infrastructure is an appropriate role for government. I, I'm a Republican and a conservative one who believes in a limited government, but, um, but roads and bridges and, and, um, and the 21st century technologies, I think, form the type of infrastructure where we have an appropriate role in making sure that all of our citizens are, are served. I mean, that, you know, I, I've heard more than one story about how the only place with reliable um, internet service in some, you know, areas of Georgia is the local library system. Mm -hmm. And it closes at five or six o'clock and you have, you know, kids huddled around there at night trying to complete their uh, homework because it's the only place in the community where they can get access to the internet and that is something that we shouldn't tolerate in 21st century Georgia. Another issue that really affects rural counties is health care and the health care crisis and everything from Medicaid reimbursements to access the certificate of need. What would you like to see the state do to make it without just coming in and we know that government intervention 100% and health care doesn't work, but what can Georgia do to help our hospitals and our communities? Well, I think we have to rethink how health care is, uh, is delivered. You know, we passed legislation dealing with micro uh, hospitals in an effort to try to expand the availability of emergency care. Um, telemedicine can play a, a role, and we've get, there's been some great breakthroughs at uh, Medical College of Georgia um, uh, in the areas of telemedicine, but telemedicine only works where you have a broadband connection to the internet. So, you know, in many ways, solving the healthcare problem is related to solving the, the broadband access problem. Um, you have been in the legislature for the tenure of all of the discussions over cannabis oil and, um, you know, access and the whole debate. What would you like to see happen over the next five or 10 years, you know, for Georgia and these families that are currently having to break federal law to get it here, what what can we do? And would you support an expansion of the list of conditions? I supported the initial access for the children suffering from those terrible seizure disorders, and 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 I, I believe I I would have to look back on my voting record, but I believe I've supported other expansions. There's there's other ones I have not. My frustration is the federal government not allowing. Uh, research on on cannabis. It's a Schedule One drug, which means that uh, that they've concluded that there's no medical value to it at all. When there's plenty of anecdotal evidence and some um, research from Europe, which suggests that it does have um, some medicinal benefit, uh, but but uh, 
it's an uncomfortable position for legislators to be making what are essentially medical decisions based on uh, Wikipedia articles and, and Google research and, and uh, antidotes. There ought to be uh, clinical trials that are sponsored by uh, academic institutions, you know, with approval from the, uh, the federal government so that we can determine, you know, where this can be helpful and where it isn't. And that's my biggest frustration. We've passed resolution after resolution urging Congress to move this off Schedule One and allow research. We passed legislation that allowed the Medical College of Georgia to do trials, but they've been reluctant to, to do that because it remains federally illegal. That's one of the problems with all of the, the state laws that we've passed. Even though you know, we've specifically authorized um, you know, these oils to be used in certain instances in Georgia, the people that, that take advantage of those state laws are still in violation of a federal law. And while the Obama administration said they wouldn't enforce the federal laws, the, the Trump administration has indicated that its approach is, uh, is different. And so we're, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a very uncomfortable position for, for, for us to be in. Um, an issue that has not always been a state level issue, but kind of is transitioning now is illegal immigration. Um, what kinds of initiatives would you support as Lieutenant Governor to kind of assist the federal government in cracking down, or would you at all, or what is your position on that? Well, obviously we're a nation of immigrants and their uh, descendants from the American Indians who came here from Asia over the, the frozen uh, Bering Straits to the people who came here by ship and plane uh, in the ensuing uh, centuries. But history has taught us one thing, that countries that lose control of their borders cease to be countries. And I support President Trump's call to secure our uh, border. We have to, um, if, if, if we're going to remain a country, we have to have control of our borders. And I support his border uh, uh, enforcement initiatives and the building of the, uh, of the wall. Um, you know, I, I've supported legislation that bans uh, sanctuary cities and, um, and sanctuary campuses. I do not believe that we should uh, encourage or facilitate acts that are um, uh, illegal. Um, you know, obviously the federal government has to solve this in a more comprehensive way, but we shouldn't be party to uh, lawlessness. Um, I see on your push card here that you were endorsed by the National Rifle Association. So what is your 30-second elevator speech on your position on the Second Amendment? I'm the only candidate for uh, Lieutenant Governor that's been rated A-plus by the National Rifle Association every year that he served in the state Senate. I've sponsored over 16 um, Second Amendment uh, pieces of legislation, legislation designed to preserve and protect our Second Amendment rights. The two guys that I'm running against haven't signed a single one, a single Second Amendment bill in the entire time that they've served in the General Assembly. So I've been endorsed by National Life to, Right to Life, I'm sorry, by, na by the National Rifle Association, and uh, I've been endorsed by Georgia Carey as, as well. And, uh, you know, I'll continue to, to fight for our Second Amendment rights if I have an opportunity to serve as Lieutenant Governor. Do you feel like Georgia could continue to work to restore some of our rights, or do you feel like we're, you're comfortable where we are at, kind of hold steady? I mean, I mean I'm a, um, uh, what Margaret Thatcher uh, called a relentless incrementalist. Uh, you know, we've made a number of important advances, and we just need to continue to, uh, to do that. What would you like your legacy as Lieutenant Governor to be? What do you want people to say after you've kind of reigned over the Senate for eight or 10 years or 12 years? Or what, what do you want your legacy to be? My immediate concern is to try to improve the processes by which uh, legislation is uh, considered. But obviously I'm a conservative Republican and I, one of the reasons that I want to see those processes improved is because I believe that'll result in better conservative policies uh, being adopted. I'd like to uh, you know, continue to promote um, um, fiscal conservatism, making sure that we're the best possible stewards of our tax dollars. And I want to um, protect our Second Amendment rights. I want to protect a, a, a culture of, uh, of life. I mean, I want to use the time that I have in public office to advance the conservative values that I know that most Republicans share. Um, you have a lengthy list of endorsements here as well. Do you want to talk a little bit about those and why they're important to you? And why you felt the need I, to share them? I, I, I mentioned I've been endorsed by the National Rifle Association, by, um, by GeorgiaCarry.org, by Georgia Conservatives in Action, 
uh, by uh, the jo Family Policy Alliance of Georgia, by Senator Ted Cruz, by former Speaker Newt Gingrich, Senator uh, Rick Santorum, the leading conservative uh, political figures and leaders and organizations. Uh, because in the time that I've served in public office, I've worked to advance the conservative values that we share. Do you feel like that's the biggest thing that sets you apart? Not the endorsements, but your track record from your opponents, or is there something It's else? the track record. So the, the endorsements in and of themselves don't mean much. What, what is meaningful is why those endorsements were made. And those endorsements were made because I've got a track record of advancing our conservative values and principles under the Gold Dome. And, um, and my opponents are both decent fellows who, who pushed the right button most of the time that they served in the General Assembly, but they haven't led on the issues in the way that I've led. What is one thing that you would like voters to know about you before May 22nd? That I will fight for the conservative values that we as Republicans uh, share. I've spent my entire, the early part of my adult life trying to get Republican, uh, the Republican Party into the majority in Georgia, and I've spent the second part of my adult life trying to hold accountable Republican elected officials to the promises that we made when we convinced Georgians to, to put us in the majority. Can you let us know where we can learn more about you? Yes, ma'am. I've got a website at uh, www.votedavid.com, and I'd encourage you to visit that website and learn more about me. Well, I really appreciate you sitting down with us today. Thank well, you so much. This was great. Thank you so very much for Good having luck. me as your guest.